We've seen many high-profile so-called psychics throughout the years that flaunt their supposed powers to attain a life of fame and fortune that they often lead as cults of personality, and time and time again they are exposed in brutal fashion. How convinced are you that you're going to win a million dollars? I'm convinced. I, I have great confidence in my abilities. Now. Oh, it looks like you've got one right. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, you mm -hmm. do not get the million dollars. Okay. So this doesn't make you think twice as to whether or not you're psychic? No. I still believe I'm psychic. But there is one man who stands out, not only in his alleged supernatural feats, but in his deeds and lifestyle, his legacy so fantastic that even I, a non-believer, find interesting. He is one of the most well-regarded psychics of all time, the sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce. Now before we get into this, I want to reiterate that I am a non-believer. I don't believe in psychic powers, I don't believe in ghosts or spirits or clairvoyance or any of that stuff. I believe there is a rational explanation for everything. Now, Edgar Cayce is the most documented psychic of all time. Unfortunately, most of what's written about him was written by people who already buy into all this stuff. I mean, do a search for him online and try to find a source that doesn't also mention the healing properties of crystals or star signs or some other such shit. What the fuck is this? Also, he lived 100 years ago, so his works and writings about him were not as subject to as much scrutiny as they would be today. So history has probably been kind to him. What I'm trying to say is, I take all of this with a grain of salt. His life story, as presented by these sources, is certainly favourable to Casey, but I will deliver it as such, accepting this version of events as true, because it is a very interesting story. Edgar Casey was born to a family of farmers in 1877 in Kentucky. As a child, Casey claimed to be able to see spirits, which in today's age would get him put on meds. By age 10, he had taken a keen interest in church and read through the Bible over and over. He would read the Bible at least once every year for the rest of his life. He left school in his teens because his family could no longer afford it and spent his early adulthood pursuing employment. For the next decade, he holds various jobs, moves around and gets married. In 1900, he moves back to his hometown and forms a business partnership with his dad selling insurance. This wouldn't last long as Edgar suddenly lost his voice and couldn't speak beyond a whisper. He took up a job as a photographer which did not require as much from his voice. He became quite good at photography and it seemed he had finally found the job for him. It was his true calling in life if you discount becoming a world renowned psychic. Oh yeah, let's get to that bit now. Still struggling with his lost voice, Casey meets a travelling hypnotist who offers to cure him while he's in town. I really love the old timey vibes here. The hypnotist induces a trance-like state and Casey regains his voice, but the cure is only temporary. The hypnotist is unable to assist further as he must continue his travels, leaving Casey to the local hypnotist, Al Lane. In a follow-up session, Lane put Edgar Casey into a trance. Only this time, Casey, while still in the trance, described his own ailment and suggested the treatment. Following this advice, Lane administered the treatment, and when he awoke, Edgar Casey's voice had returned for good. He had no recollection of diagnosing himself while in the trance. Okay, in this case, I would just like to bring up how everything here could have very easily been under Edgar's control. He could have just stopped talking and then started again when he felt like it. And also, let's not forget that he lost his voice while working with his dad and took on another job instead. You'll find this quite the coincidence if you've ever had to do anything with your immediate family. DIY projects, driving lessons, very basic tasks on the computer. I don't think it's too extraordinary to suggest Casey just faked losing his voice to get out of working with his dad. Hell, when I was still living at home I lost my sight on five separate occasions. But Casey would go on to perform feats that even I have a hard time rationalising. Lane was stunned by what had happened and was keen to explore Casey's apparent abilities. He experimented putting Edgar to sleep and getting him to diagnose Lane's issues and treatments for them. Lane found Edgar's medical advice to be accurate, despite Casey not having any medical know-how or even a full education. Edgar was very sceptical of his supposed clairvoyance as he did not know what he was reportedly saying in his sleep and was worried that the remedies he was suggesting were potentially dangerous. 
Al Lane eventually managed to convince Casey to enter a partnership and offer to treat members of the public, with Lane inducing the trance state and Casey physically diagnosing patients. Casey's only condition was that the readings be free. He continued with his full-time work and assisted Lane's patients in his spare time. Edgar Casey's methods were always the same. He would enter a trance-like state during which it would seem as if another being spoke with his voice and would assist with medical problems. His suggested remedies were largely holistic, ranging from homeopathic medicines to massages. He didn't even need for the patient to be present during the reading, saying he only needed to know their name and location, and as word of his powers started to spread, he would perform his readings long distance with Lane reading letters to him and writing down the response. The two eventually went their separate ways and Edgar Casey moved on with his wife and set up his own photography studio with a relative. Doctors took interest in Edgar and with his cooperation performed experiments on his psychic abilities which seemed to confirm the accuracy of his readings. They offered him lucrative business partnerships, but Casey was still hesitant to give out medical advice in fears of hurting someone. He was even more hesitant to take money for it. If he really did have a supernatural ability, he wanted to use it to help people. He turned down all offers. Unfortunately for Casey, a fire in his photography studio in 1906 and another in 1907 led to consignments being lost and the shop being destroyed. The fires were the cause of Edgar Casey's death. Oh sorry, death. Debt. He was in debt. He also had another mouth to feed as he had just had a son. Struggling to pay off his debts, Casey eventually relented and accepted a business partnership with Wesley Ketchum. This allowed Casey to set up a new photography studio and his readings were gaining popularity, receiving more clients and being publicised in newspapers. In 1911, Edgar and his wife Gertrude had a second son. Both were still sceptical of Casey's supposed psychic abilities and it is said that this prevented them from saving the life of their second child, who died just two months after birth. The same year, Gertrude developed chronic tuberculosis, and in desperation, Casey made use of his ability to suggest a remedy, which apparently cured her. Shortly after, Edgar discovered that his new business partner, Ketchum, had sometimes been using the readings for gambling while Edgar was asleep. He promptly ended his involvement and moved to Alabama, while here, he once again took up photography. Jesus, he loved taking pictures. Here, Edgar had another son. He continued to do readings with his wife and eventually his eldest son taking the place of the hypnotist. At this time, his finances were very poor and although he was still giving the readings for free, he asked for voluntary donations. He even became more open to using his readings for commercial ventures, occasionally lending his ability to those who wanted to know the outcomes of horse races or the location of hidden treasures. Supposedly the accuracy of these readings was poor and left Casey unsatisfied. He vowed to stop using his powers for gain. In 1923 he met with two people who would have a lasting impact on his legacy. He took on a secretary Gladys Davis who would write down Casey's readings and document them all. This is important because by this time, Casey's readings were very popular and he did a lot of them. Davis's records from this point on give us insight into Casey's appointments and are the reason Casey remains the most well-documented psychic to this day, with Davis having recorded over 14,000 files over the span of Casey's career. The other influential person would appear seemingly as just another patient. One day, Arthur Lammers came for a reading, and while Casey was in his trance state, Lammers began to ask philosophical questions about life and death. Arthur Lammers had an interest in metaphysics and asked Casey about the topics of reincarnation and astrology. Casey's responses validated Lammers' beliefs. Upon awakening, Casey, a devout Christian, refused to believe he had endorsed these teachings, which went against his faith but Gladys showed him her notes, which recorded his readings as such. Excited by these findings, Lammers worked with Casey through numerous readings to develop these theories. Although conflicted, Casey was eventually able to reconcile his Christianity with these metaphysical teachings. They developed an esoteric theory that there was one basic truth and that all the major religions shared this truth in one fashion or another. Their theory involved the ideas of reincarnation, past lives and other beliefs which at the time were regarded as occult. They had the idea to open a hospital where Casey could perform his healings and form an association. 
Casey would incorporate his new teachings with his readings. Unfortunately, Lammers would run into financial troubles and wouldn't be able to go any further with Casey. So he had all these ideas, but he couldn't put his money where his mouth is. He's like one of those guys that tell you they've got a real great idea for an artwork or an app that is guaranteed to go viral, but they can only pay you in exposure. Yeah, are we sure this guy isn't still alive today? I think I know him. Edgar Casey was undeterred by Lammers pulling out and was able to find funding from a stock exchange worker who shared Casey's vision. And so the Casey Hospital was built in Virginia and the Association of National Investigations was formed to manage the scientific study of the readings. By now, Casey was a professional psychic with a number of employees and volunteers working for him, including medical doctors. The hospital allowed for continued follow-ups with patients so that they could record and research the accuracy and effectiveness of the readings and remedies, hoping to be able to compile a knowledge base that they could share with the world. The hospital was very popular and had a waiting list of months in advance. However, the Great Depression hit and funding to the hospital came to an end. The hospital closed in 1931. Despite this, many still followed Casey and his spiritual teachings on karma, astrology and reincarnation were becoming as popular as the readings. The Association for Research and Enlightenment was created for Casey to continue his readings and host study groups. Allegedly, the association had around 500 members. By the 1940s, both Casey's son had gone off to fight in World War II. Casey drastically increased his number of readings per day as requests flooded in with families wanting to know about their men in the war. This took a great toll on Casey and even his own readings warned that he was taking on too much. And sure enough, Edgar Casey died in 1945 at the age of 67. The Association for Research and Enlightenment is still going strong today and Casey is still a very well regarded psychic. And this is just a brief summary of his life. There's a lot more, such as his prophecies, but there's only so many frames of this stuff that I can draw before I want to kill myself. If you're interested, I will leave you to your own research. Of course, I still won't believe in any of this psychic stuff. There are many techniques, such as cold reading, that psychics use that give the appearance of clairvoyance. And while they certainly require a lot of skill, almost anyone can learn them. That may be another video for another time. Even for a non-believer, it sure is an interesting story. It's very unique too. I've read the profiles of a lot of these guys who gain large followings preaching some sort of dubious esoteric teachings from L. Ron Hubbard to Wilhelm Reich. And I have to say, Edgar Cayce's life story is by far the least offensive. Where most others use their supposed powers to amass fortunes, act in an obscene manner, and found what are essentially cults. And I mean, hey, look, I'd do the same. Why do you think I started this YouTube shit? Edgar Casey lived a pretty modest lifestyle. Sometimes he was dirt poor and supposedly often turned down offers and partnerships, which would have been very lucrative for him. Unlike many other supposed psychics, it's hard to make the claim that Casey was maliciously misleading others for his own gain. Was he just deluded and thought pretending to be psychic was really helping people? Was he actually sleep talking and unconsciously speaking as if he held all the answers to life's questions totally unintentionally? I know I sometimes talk in my sleep, but this seems like an another level. Anyways, I'd like to know what you think, so let me hear you in the comment section. And one more thing, I've got this sick ass merch out now, so if you want to look like this, well, I'm sorry we actually don't have the technology for that, but if you buy some of my merch, you can come pretty close. So do it. Do it. <laughs>